22, and we're going to begin reading at verse 22. And I didn't mean to cut y'all off. Y'all need more time, don't you, when it comes, don't you? Yes. Okay, here we go. That same night, or the same night, he arose and took two wives, his two wives, come by Jacob, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him. That just kind of snuck in there. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of his thigh. Thank you. Please be seated. Father, please bless the reading of your word. Please let it be like fire and set your people's hearts on fire. May today all that we do be to lift you up, Lord Jesus, to talk about you, to glorify you and ascribe all glory to you. For it's in your mighty name we do pray. Amen. And so, takeaways for this week. The lesson wants you to learn people should expect to encounter God in times of their greatest need. I expect there's one or two of you all who can identify with that. Psalm 18 says, He rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me, excuse me, He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because He delighted in me. That's our God. Now, they also want you to take away from this week believers have a new identity after they encounter. God. What does Romans 6 say about that? We believers, you and me, we are those who have died. Died to sin, excuse me. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we Two, that's you and me, may live a new life. And then finally, they want you to take away believers can celebrate God's working in their lives. God works in your lives. I know he does. I know some of y'all. I know that God does stuff in your life. So are you celebrating? Are you grateful? And you're saying, boy, you meddle too much. <laughs> Ephesians 1.3 says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If I could dance, which I can, I'd be dancing up here as I read that scripture. My Lord, it is worth dancing about. Scripture goes on to say in Psalm 100. Now, this is what we ought to be doing, what it tells us in the scripture. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. That's Lee Evans. He makes a joyful noise. God bless it. Serve the Lord. I'm sorry, Lee. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. Are y'all doing that? I'm meddling again. All right, let's go on and talk about the lesson. Now we got Jacob. Man, this guy's a mess. I'm telling you. So <laughs> Jacob had left his homeland in a hurry. He had upset his brother and his father. And they were after him. That is to say, his brother was. He had lied and deceived both of them, as you recall. Now he goes to his uncle Laban up in Haran, about 550 miles away. He works for him for 14 years to get two wives. He got tricked, just as he had tricked. Just as he had been lied to, excuse me, just as he lied, he had been lied to. Had to work 14 years for two wives. Then another six years to provide for his family. Y'all remember we talked about it last week. 
God blessed him, though, in all of that, materially and with a family. He protected Jacob. He said he would. He was particularly blessed with those two wives. Remember, we talked about multiple wives, uh, Leah and Rachel. So y'all tell me this morning, what was significant about the sons of Leah and Rachel? Do y'all know anything? Can you remember anything as you were studying for the lesson? Let's start with Leah. What was significant? Joanne, raise your hand. Go ahead. Trying to say this. We have got to leave Leah the credit. You know, she was not the favorite wife. And yet God favored her and allowed her to give birth to Judah, for which Christ was born. Yeah. That's awesome. And also, not only Judah, but just before Judah was born, number three, who was born? That'd be Levi? That would be Levi. So Levi, the tribe of Levites, came from Leah. She was not the favored wife. She was favored by God. Yes, she was. And of course, the line of our Lord Jesus Christ came through Judah. Judah. So pretty significant. Y'all remember how many children that Leah had? Leah had two, right? She had a pot full. Okay. And in her maid had a couple to go with it. She, there were a total of nine. She had seven, had six sons, one daughter. Y'all remember the daughter's name? A little trivia. If I had chocolate, I'd be throwing it out. Anybody remember her name? Donna. There you go, Donna. Bible stuff. Yes, you are. So, what was significant about Rachel? She was beautiful. But is that so significant? What was her heart like? With respect to her children, though, what was significant about her children? She had two sons. I'll help you out. Of those two sons, one was Joseph. And Joseph, God used him to save the family. So that's a big deal. When they were going into the promised land, Jacob had blessed Joseph. He gave him a double portion. So his two sons were adopted by Jacob, became part of the twelve, and took possession in the promised land. That would have been Ephraim. And that would have been Manasseh. And I know y'all know that. I give y'all that for nothing. So anyway, that's what's significant about their sons. Now, Jacob had just emerged with a confrontation with Laban. As you read the scripture leading up to the day, Laban had come after him. You think he was coming because he was going to miss his family and he just wanted to bless them and love them? No. He looked on Jacob and his family and all his possessions as his own. So Jacob leaving with the family and all that livestock, that upset him incredibly. But what did God do? He came to Laban in a dream and he said, don't you say anything to Jacob, either good or bad. The Lord intervened on the behalf of Jacob on respect to Laban. So now he sent a message to Esau. And what did he get back in reply? Esau is coming with 400 men to greet his brother wants to give him a holy kiss in a big time way. You believe that? <laughs> Jacob didn't believe it. No, 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 no. 400 men, the way you raise an army, and we can call that a small army back then, was you said, okay, you come with me, we're going to kill and rape, and we're going to take booty. We're going to take all the possessions that we can take. And that's what had been said to these guys, or they wouldn't have got on their camel and ridden across the desert for a bunch of miles just to say hello and give somebody a holy kiss. Did that way. Jacob was doing a wise thing when he prepared for that. So anyway, we got to remember about Esau. He had been deceitfully used and lied to by Jacob, his brother. The last thing we hear about the interactions between Jacob and Esau, we look at Genesis 27, and this is what it says. So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing his father had given to his brother. Esau said privately, the time of mourning for my father is near. Then I will kill my brother, Jacob. Jacob, not an idiot. He knew this. So he's taking precautions. Now, in all of this, where does God fit? What do we see God doing working at this time? If you remember that when Jacob took off and he headed up for Haran after Esau had threatened him, he was at a place called Luz, and he renamed it Bethel, house of God, because the Lord came to him. And this is what God said to him at that time. He would, And just keep it in mind, when he's making this trip up, he's 77 years old. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. Then in Genesis 31, 3, uh, God talks to or speaks to him again. Return to the land of your fathers 
and your kindred, and I will be with you. This is when he's been there for 20 years, been working for his wives and working for his livestock. The Lord told Jacob in a dream that he saw what Laban was doing to him. That's in Genesis 31. For well, I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. Laban, as you recall, it changed his wages 10 times. Made it hard for him. Made it hard for him. So in all this, the question, is, where's is God in all this? He's protecting Jacob. He's blessing him materially with his wife, with his family, and spiritually, he's growing Jacob. It was a slow process for Jacob. You ever feel like it's a slow process for you and your relationship with God? How are you doing with that? Are you where you need to be? Are you as mature as you want to be? And again, I'm meddling. I know I am, but I have to ask this question because the lesson tells me to ask these kind of questions. Anybody want to answer that? I'm kidding. No. Here we go. The Lord protected Jacob. Genesis 31, if you look and see how what he did, all that he did. The camp of the Lord, now they had come to this place in Genesis 32. It tells us they had come to the camp of the Lord. Uh, Jacob named it Mahanaim. Can y'all say that fast three times? <laughs> Mahanaim is Aramaic. But what it means is two camps. And what did Jacob see there? Angels. He saw angels. We talked about angels before in this class. Y'all believe in angels? They exist. We have, before we have Sunday before we have church, I always pray, sit your angels, sit your mighty warriors, and put our heads around in Sunday school. Mm -hmm. And that happens there. I know if we had spiritual eyes, we'd look around and we'd see angels. Y'all believe that? Okay. So the camp of the Lord is where the angels met Jacob. What do we get that? God is protecting this man. He's got Laban behind him, he's got Esau in front of him, but he's got God all around him. What do we read in scripture? God protects us. If you belong to him, he protects you. Sometimes we act like God doesn't. He's not there. We forget about him, or we don't pay as much as attention as we should, but God does not forget us. He protects us round about. I don't have any doubt about that. Now, so what's Jacob doing? What's he feeling in all of this? He gets worried back about those 400 men. Scripture says he's greatly afraid and distressed. 400 bubbas coming after me, I'd be a little bit concerned as well. If it was a handful, I would be a little bit concerned. But he's got 400. He better be. So what does he do? He divides his people into two camps. His, his logic is, well, he may attack one camp, the other camp will survive. We won't lose everything. But then what do you do? And we talked a little bit last week about it. He prayed. And it was a significant prayer. It's because it was a prayer made in humility. It was a prayer made because he had a broken and he had a contrite spirit and a broken heart. And this is a prayer that he prayed. It bears repeating. And Jacob said, oh, God of my father, Abraham, and God of my father, Isaac. He acknowledges God Almighty. Oh, Lord, who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred that I may do you good. Now, he's reminding God of what God has promised him. You do that in your prayer sometimes. It's okay. I remind God what I think he has said or what I have read in scripture. Lord, this is a deal. This is what you said. And so I ask based on what you have said. That's okay. Jacob did it. Abraham did it. So many in scripture give that example to us. So it's okay for us to pray that way. Remind God of what he said. Does he need reminding? No, but he does Make it in us that we acknowledge what he has said and what he does. It increases our relationship. It increases the love that we have for God. When we remember what he's done, when he reminds us what he's done, when we see it all manifested in our lives. Now he prayed, I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. He says, I'm not worthy. Are your prayers full of humility like Jacob's was? They ought to be. We ought to be humble before God because he is God Almighty. Do we have any excuse to be full of pride? Jacob certainly didn't. He knew it. He was in a bad place. So he got real humble. I have been in some bad places, and I'm sure you have too. What happens when we do that? We get down on our knees real quick. We shouldn't have to be forced to get down on our knees, but unfortunately, human condition, that's what happens. But this man got humble. I'm not worthy, he said, for with only my staff, I crossed the Jordan. He had nothing. 
Now he's going back with, this guy's a millionaire, relatively speaking, given that time and place. If you count the stock that he sent as a gift, that's not all the stock, just that he sent, it's approximately 600 head of cows, camels, sheep, goats, and donkeys. If you've got the King James Version, it says asses. So it's incredible how God had blessed that man, and he acknowledged that. Where are you today in your relationship with God? Are you acknowledging what God has done for you? Most of us are mature. Some of y'all are still young, and God is still blessing you. And he will certainly do that all the days of your life. But are we acknowledging what God has done for us? Are you doing that in your life? I'm looking at you in the eyeball this morning, and I'm asking you, do you acknowledge God Almighty, the one who created you, the one who gives you breath right now, and thank him and remember him for all he's done in your life? Yes. That's exactly what Jacob was doing. It's a good thing we should be doing the same thing. He said, he went on, he asked him specifically what he needed. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother. He knows Esau is not coming to give him a holy kiss. He's telling God, please help me. Are your prayers that specific? If they aren't, they ought to be. He's praying out of a burning heart. He needs help. But you know, Jacob has come to the point where it's not just all about him. He's praying for the protection of those two wives that he loves and all those children that he's got. He's praying for God's protection and he's remembering the promise. He is the son of of the promised child. He is in the line of the Messiah and he's remembering all of this. And he is praying that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's essentially what he's doing, but it's not about him. He's praying for the protection of his family. Men, I have said it to you a number of times. Are you protecting your family? If you're a man sitting there this morning and you have a family, you have a responsibility unique before God. And you better not be turning your back on it because there are consequences when you disobey God. Scripture says, if you don't provide for your family, you're worse than a pagan. I'm talking to you, man. And you get mad at me and say, well, oh, you're meddling and you should mind your own business. And that's okay. Go ahead. I'm telling you what Scripture says. And I don't care if you get mad at me. It makes no difference what you think about me. I'm not even interested. God's word does matter. If you're not taking care of your family, protecting them. Now, let me ask you this. You say, yeah, I do all that. I go to work every day, provide for them. Are you praying for them? What's the greatest weapon you have as a protector of your family? I can't whip every bubble that comes at me. I can't even begin to do it. I might get two or three, but eventually, excuse me, they're going to get me. But you can never whip God. It don't happen. If God is your protector, you are good. I'm Richard White is sitting here today because God protected him in the midst of we don't even want to go there. And how many of us have we known? God protects you in the worst of situations. And if you're a man and you're not praying for the protection of your family, then get on your knees this afternoon before you go to lunch. Ask God to forgive you. And you be praying and God will protect your family. Do what you're supposed to be doing. And not just today, but every day, throughout the day. That's your responsibility. That's what Jacob was doing. He went from a man who was a liar and a deceiver to a man who was asking God to protect his family and all those who were under his protection. Big difference. Big difference. We need to be the same. He said, for I fear him, talking about Esau, that he may come and attack me. And what did he say? The mothers with the children. He's praying for them specifically. You need to be doing the same thing. And this is what he said. He reminds God again. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. That was his prayer. That was the smartest thing he did. That was what delivered him, that prayer before God. Now, as I said, he said about 600 head of livestock. That, I read one commentary, he said that was a practical thing to do. It was practical. What was the most practical thing he did? We just talked about prayer. I hate it when people say prayer is not practical. The first thing you ought to do is be practical and pray. And then if there's anything you can do materially in this world to make restitution, to get things right, to work to assuage the anger that we see like Esau has, then you do it. You do what you can do. You do everything that it's in your power to do because God created you in that way. And what you cannot do, guess who's going to do it? When you lined up with prayer, God's going to do it. 
He's going to do what you can't do. That's right. Now, he put his five children and servants across the river before daylight in case the river rose at night. I read one commentator said, don't know why he did it at night. I know why he did it at night because he don't know what's going to happen come morning time. He wants to get it done, protect his family. He put everyone ahead of himself. That's where he had come from. It's all about Jacob. Now it's all about what God has given me and my family and my children. He is taking care of them first. Now, Scripture says in verse 24, and Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him. Where did this man come from? Until the breaking of day. Now, does Jacob have completely alone? Does, does, that he is completely alone, excuse me, that he is completely alone, does that have any significance? My clap for you. What significance that Jacob was completely alone? I know you've got an answer for that. Well, he, he wasn't left alone because God was there. And the, the text may be indicating that he sensed that he was alone, and now it's time for him to have this encounter with God. Amen. Thank you for that. I want to point out that Jacob was 97 years old at this point in time, about 97. Mm -hmm. He was alone, Scripture says. He was afraid, and he was significantly distressed. That's what the Scripture says. So put that combination together. You ever felt like that? You ever felt alone, distressed, and afraid? Have you ever been there? What happens to you? Like we talked about, you get humble. He got humble. He was a broken man, if you would. A broken man at this point. What do you think God wanted him? This is what God wanted in his life. He wanted a man with a broken and a contrite spirit. Because then God can get his attention, talk to him, develop him, refine him like a diamond. And that's what he's doing with Jacob. From the deceiver to the protector. He was alone, afraid, and broken, and God is going to use that. Now, he's not a happy man. He's filled with fear and doubt. You know what's happening. What J. Vernon McGee said, I was reading his commentary about this this week. He said the chickens, y'all know this, the chickens are coming home to roost. Esau has been deceived and lied to, had his birthright stolen. He's going to come show this guy that he's going to take that birthright back. The chickens are coming home to roost, and he knows it. What goes around, I heard old Hank say this a time or two, what goes around, comes around. You sin, do your brother and sister wrong, you can be sure there are going to be consequences to it. It's going to come home to you. It's going to come home to you. What goes around, comes around. So, he's alone. Now, here's the intriguing question about all of this. When you're reading this scripture, to me, it was. Who is the man that wrestles with Jacob. Who is the man that wrestles with Jacob? Richard, what do you think? You think it was God? Hank, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And though he's a broken man, he was a grizzly bear. You know, Jacob was a broken man. I don't think he was a weak man. He farmed, he protected his family, he did things that other men couldn't do. But he was broken in spirit for sure. Amen. Gail, who do you think it is? Who was that man that talks about his wrestling with him? You heard what these folks said. What do you think? Who was that man? Or the Lord. I think it was the Lord. You're not sure which. Well, you know, sometimes the angel of the Lord represents the Lord, but I just, what I believe is that this wrestling, he wrestled with the... Okay, you're getting ahead of me. We're going to come back. Come back. I don't think Change the name. The angel can't change the name, right? The Lord can. Yeah, right. 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 Not to disagree with you, but just to take another perspective, if the angel is working for God and God has given him the authority, yeah. the angel can say, Yeah, your name is there. Do you buy into that? Yeah, but I know what you're saying. That's a very, very good argument. And I, I, I've heard that argument and I can't dispute it. So, there are some, Tony, I meant to call on you. What do you think? You surely have got an opinion. Why? And Daniel, you, where are you? There you are. Tony Burke, come here. You don't know. 
Um, Tony says we don't know. I, I tend to agree that with you that you know God can do anything. He can send a representative. I tend to agree that it, it's a an angel of the Lord <clears throat> because Jacob is wrestling and <clears throat> this representative or this man couldn't overcome Jacob. God could overcome. Yeah, you know, yeah. Just right and dead if you want. That's okay. So I don't know. I tend to believe that it's an angel. Yeah, it's one of those questions in scripture that comes up and we don't always have the answer. Dan, what do you think? Real quick, because I need to go more. Well, I think it's like just throughout most of the Old Testament, there's many of them, what they call pre incarnate appearance of Christ, like the Matilda Day with Abraham. Some speculate that they might have been a pre incarnate Christ. We also, uh, this situation is also the burning lane you know, when she wrapped in the fiery furnace to forge her to another pre incarnate Christ. And so there's several appearances that people believe this is where Christ shows up in his, I guess, because Christ existed from the beginning, so he existed even before he was born in Bethlehem. Yeah. And so these appearances are, many believe, are where Christ shows up in his, I guess, pre I don't know, that's what a lot of people Yeah. Yeah. Pre-incarnate Christ is, is what you hear a uh, number of times. Okay, Lee. Thank you, Russell. Good job. Good God maybe in the form of an angel, but I think God was the one that he had ultimate. We all have to wrestle with God and everything we do. The best, I agree. I, I agree with what you're saying. I hear what you're saying. Uh, all of y'all, good answers. Scripture, Dr. Tan, I cannot pass over you. Go ahead. Regardless, whether it's God or his angel, my question is what? Wrestle with him all night. We want to get to him. Angel or God, he can in the split seconds defeat Jacob, right? Yeah. Why did he allow him to be able to wrestle with him all night? This is interesting stuff, and but the most important question is the one that you called up. So, but I will refer you out to what scripture is. The best commentary on scripture is scripture. So we want to answer this question, go to Hosea 12, I think it's verse 4. He says it was an angel. But if you look at verse 3, he refers to him as God. So you've got God and you've got an angel. Most commentators will say, most scholars, most theologians have come down with what Daniel was talking about is a pre-incarnate Christ. I don't know. I do believe it's God. Because, indeed, he did change his name. Well, then he said, and I've seen God face to face. Amen. Exactly. Exactly. But then... But, but now, that's for another question. I'll leave that alone. It's good stuff. Now, but now, here's a question. We got to finish with this because we're out of time. Why? Why the wrestling? Why did it go on all night? All that that was Dr. Tan was talking about. Why? What was going on here? And Michael had a good answer for that when I was talking to him before. And he was saying, in essence, that Jacob has come to the point. God is leading him from the darkness to the light. He is making him a new man. What do you do? He gives him a new name. What happens with new names? New errors, new epics in scripture. New things are being done. He has gone from the old man, the man who was dead in sin, to the man who's alive in Christ. This is a pre-incarnate Christ. I believe that. He is alive in Christ. He has been crucified with Christ because he has believed. God has made him a new man. Jacob has gone from the deceiver to a man of God. And his life, this prayer that he prayed, is a reflection of that. Where are you sitting this point? Are you that new man or new woman in Christ? Are you what you want to be? Most of y'all Christians sitting here, I expect all of y'all are. Are you where you want to be in your relationship with Christ? If you are not, then all you need is a broken and a contrite heart and to get on your knees and your Lord will save you this morning. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the day and the blessings of the Lord. I am particularly burdened this morning because of all the prayer requests, because of all that's going on with the people that we love who are part of our class. So much. Please have mercy on your people sitting here this morning and those who couldn't be here. Please. Have mercy on them, Father. Please lift them up and heal them. Please make a way for them. Please melt their hearts. And if they're not looking to you, if they are not praying, asking for your mercy, please move their hearts to the point that they do that. 
But now we, Father, this morning, you told us to join our hearts together. So we join our hearts together and we ask you, please, to have mercy and do all that you can do for us, the sheep of your pasture. Lord, we ask it all in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Love y'all. Come back.